Good evening. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing this first song as we jump into our, I guess, our first actual night of revival. We're going to sing this song, Revive Us Again. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord this evening. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. What the mercy of God can do. If you knew me then, you'd believe me now. He turned my whole life upside down. He took the old and he made it new. That's what the mercy of God can do. I'm alive to tell the story how I've overcome It's His goodness and mercy and the power of the blood I'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done But His goodness and mercy and the power of the blood. Thought I deserved to be six feet beneath the earth. For the things I've done, the things I've said, the choices made that I regret, oh, I would still be lost. But for the mercy of God, I would like to tell the story.
aren't you glad it's not based on what we've done? We don't have a whole lot to offer God, but I'm thankful for his goodness and his mercy and his forgiveness and the grace we're going to sing about right now. Stand together with me. We'll sing this second song, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Sing out with me together as we worship one more time this evening. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold Points to the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe you that are longing to see his face will you this moment his grace receive grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sin all right so most everybody knows brother uh reuben he's been here before preached for me before we had him uh actually scheduled during covid to come and preach a revival and uh, we had an outbreak of sickness and had to cancel that and um, just haven't been able to get on the same page as far as rescheduling him. So uh, the opportunity uh, come up where he could uh, come and be a part of this revival. And so we're excited about it, excited what the Lord has for us. And so, uh, Brother Reuben, you can come on up and uh, our church will uh, make you feel welcome. And we are thankful that you are here. Thank you, Brother Cody. Appreciate that so very much. It is a joy and an honor to be here, and I appreciate Brother Cody working with us on our our uh, schedule, and uh, we're we're glad to be here this evening. Take your Bibles and be finding Acts chapter number two. Acts chapter number two. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, and appreciate Brother Nick. Where'd he go? <laughs> uh, they when they were college students, they came and. Uh, uh, we're part of our ministry there at White Oak Hill, and so uh, been loving them, and sure been praying for them in these days, and uh, thankful for God's grace and God's mercy, and uh, thank the Lord for Brother Cody and his family. Always reminds me of one of the reasons that, um, uh, just a just a sidebar reason, I guess, not the main reason for being a Christian, but uh, I grew up in a preacher's home and uh, started preaching when I was relatively young and been away from my biological family just about all my life. And so, um, uh, but God has put precious people in my life through the years. Uh, and, and there's nothing better than the family of God. 
and uh, meeting people that you would not have otherwise met had it not been for ministry and and uh, so I appreciate that so very, so very much. If you're willing, let's stand as we honor God's word this evening. Uh, you pray for us as we try to bring a message uh, simply entitled. I like sermon titles like I like book titles. I, like, I, buy, I buy books sometimes because I like the titles and never read the book. Sometimes I'm afraid the book won't be about what the title's about, and most of the time they're not, but... This sermon is sort of like that. I'm, I want to preach tonight on the Lordship of Christ, but it really grabbed my attention that this was the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. First sermon of the church, if you will. Now, we're going to jump in the uh, sort of the middle of it. it. Peter's sermon begins in verse number 14 and goes through verse number uh, 40. Uh, but we're going to read verses 32 through 36, Acts chapter number 2. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same, or that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Would you bow with me in prayer and pray for me? Father, we thank you for this precious Lord's Day you've given us. It's been a beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you, Lord, for what you did in the service here this morning, the service I was in this morning. And Lord, we come now to this evening's service. And oh God, how we pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, we need a fresh touch. Lord, I pray that in this revival that you would stir souls, that you would uh, bring us to a place of of repenting of our sin and, and, Lord, drawing close to you. As James says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Lord, I pray that you would bless this church, Brother Cody and his family as they labor here and these others who are serving here. God, would you just meet with us this evening and we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. When you think about the events leading up to the passage of scripture, scripture we've read this evening, as I mentioned a moment ago, this is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. The Lord had risen from the grave. He told the disciples to meet him on the Mount of Olives. They met him on the Mount of Olives. Jesus spent some time with them and then ascended back into heaven. And Jesus said to the disciples, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and the church was born. And I'm glad to say to you this evening, it's exciting to me that literally what we are, part, are, are a part of this evening is a continuation of what started on this day and has been going on and will continue until the rapture of the church. And so here's Peter. He is preaching this sermon. Now think about the timeline just days before what happened. He denied that he knew the Lord. I like what Dr. David Jeremiah said. He said, Peter, who just days before had been too cowardly to admit that he even knew Jesus, began preaching the gospel of Christ to the very people who had been responsible for the Lord's crucifixion. Oh, listen, here's just something for the margin of your mind. I'm so glad that God's grace and God's mercy and forgives us when we blow it. And just because we blow it doesn't mean we can't come back and serve the Lord. Amen? And so Peter had blown it. He had denied the Lord. I was listening to an audio version of the scripture the other day, and they actually had the rooster crowing. I thought that was, that was pretty neat. But aren't you glad for God's grace, God's mercy, and God's forgiveness that, that even when we fail, even when we sin, we can get forgiveness, we can ask forgiveness of that, and the Lord still uses us. 
in the work of the Lord. What a, what a testimony to God's grace and God's mercy. But I want us to understand what Peter is saying here in this sermon. He says in verse number 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, having established the fact of the power of the resurrection, he references David in verse 34 and 35. He comes and says to them, I want you to know who you crucified. Evening that Jesus died on the cross is just part of the glorious gospel message. I'm guilty of it myself. I get nervous. I still get nervous after all these years of sharing the gospel with someone uh, uh, who, who perhaps is lost or someone that we're trying. I still get nervous. I, I, I try my best to, uh, to do it right. But sometimes in our efforts to share the gospel, we stop at Calvary. We want people to know that Jesus died on the cross to save them from their sins, that if they'll confess their sins and ask Jesus into their heart, they'll be saved. But we don't keep going. And I say to us this evening, I want you to look back in verse number 23. Notice what the Bible says here in this sermon of Peter. He says in verse number 23, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now he says, I want you to know that Jesus died on the cross, but it doesn't stop there, and neither should we. You see, it doesn't end at Calvary. It begins in the garden tomb. It begins with the resurrection. Notice in verse number 24, Peter went on to say, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Oh, my friend, the Bible said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The power of the gospel lies not only in the redemptive work of Christ on Calvary, but it lies in the power of Jesus coming back to life again. That's what we're going to be looking at this evening, the power of the resurrection and the lordship of Christ. Peter said, I want you to know that, that, that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and and Christ. How important is the Lordship of Christ? The foundational truth of the New Testament, one writer said, is that Jesus Christ is Lord. The word Lord is used 747 times in the New Testament. One writer I was reading after said this, there is probably no other word in our religious vocabulary that has experienced greater robbery of meaning than the word Lord. I want us to understand this evening it's more than a name. As a matter of fact, it's really not even a name when you get right down to it. And that word just rolls off our tongue glibly sometimes. And sometimes I believe we're taking God's name in vain when we use it so, so loosely. And I want to ask you this evening, and I believe it's a good question, and God has been burning this in my heart, and I've been saved since I was a little boy. Is he your Lord this evening? Is, is he Lord of all that you have? Is he Lord of all that you do? Is, is one, writer, one writer put it this way and alliterated and I had, to, I had to steal it from him. He said, is he Lord of your thoughts? Is he Lord of your tongue? Is he Lord of your time? Is he Lord of your temper? Is he Lord of your testimony? What I'm... What I'm what I'm trying to grasp hold of this evening and I hope I do it theological justice can he be your savior and not be your Lord can we just confess Christ as far as salvation is concerned and him not be Lord of our life I want to give you three things this evening number one I want us to look at this title as I mentioned a moment ago it's not really a name so much as it is a title the Greek word is kurios. 
It was a title recognizing authority. What kind of authority? Can I tell you this evening that he is Lord because he is the one who redeemed us. The Bible said, and by the way, if you'll take, uh, keep your Bibles handy because we're going to turn to some scriptures in just a moment. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that you are not your own? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. You're not your own, for you're bought with a price. And there's not a period there, friend. It goes on to say, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So why, uh, what right? Uh, can we say that He is Lord of our life? Because He has purchased us. This Greek term, kurios, was used of one who had the right to command. It would signify the authority of the captain of a ship or the commanding officer of a military base. Perhaps we could easily identify as uh, maybe a CEO or a boss. By the way, I had the naive assumption when I was growing up, I could not wait till I got out of home. I'd be out from under mama and daddy's authority. Oh, listen, I, was, I didn't have it all together. I got married when I was 19 years old, and soon I began to realize I'll never be out on my own, say amen right there. I'll always be under somebody's authority. I can't even go down the highway and drive like I want to drive. I'm telling you what, if I have a sin tonight, it is road rage. And I'm on, I said, why did the Lord put me in something where I'm on the road all the time? But anyway, back to my sermon this evening. We'll always be under His authority because He purchased us. He is our boss, if you will, and we need to recognize his sovereignty and his right to do so. Abraham Kuyper said this, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. It's all his. This vast universe is his. This little space that I'm standing in here this evening is his. It all belongs to him. He purchased it. He purchased uh, our, listen, one writer said we have a lot of pseudo-Christians who come down an aisle, say a prayer, sign a card, been in the baptistry, but they've never been born again. This is what I'm grappling with. Perhaps they've claimed him as Savior. Perhaps they've professed him as Savior. We, we would say accept him as, as, as Savior. To be saved, to have your sins forgiven. But not recognize him as Lord. Go with me quickly to the book of Ephesians. Let's look in chapter 1. Some very important verses here. Ephesians chapter 1. Talking about the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Not going to delve into this sealing of believers this evening, but I want to get to verse 14, but let's read verse 13 to get there. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, chapter 1, Ephesians, verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, I'm sorry, in whom also, watch this, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance. Watch this next phrase. Until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. What are you saying? I'm saying this evening that when you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, that was the last, last legitimate independent decision you ever made. Why? Because he has the right to claim us as his purchased possession. 
He has the right to requisition our time. He has the right to requisition our talents. He has the right to requisition our treasures, our energies, our everything. Why? Because he's Lord and he owns it all. Oh, it's an important title. He's Lord. But let's look at this takeover, if you will. I've sort of bounced back and forth in my preparation between Acts chapter 2 and Romans 14. Go to Romans, if you will. We was reading part of Peter's sermon in, Rome, in, in Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Romans, this great treatise of our faith. From the pen of the apostle Paul, as Paul's writing to the church in Rome. Let's look here, and by the way, I'm going to flip back right quick to chapter 6, if you want to go ahead and find that. Romans 6. Boy, amen. This, this good, good scriptures we're fixing to read here. My preacher, my pages are stuck together. There we go. Romans chapter number 14, verse 7, 8, and 9. Watch what Paul says. They had been discussing the Christian and debatable things. <laughs> he says in verse 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. That sound like what we're talking about this evening? This purchase possession? If you don't live to yourself, you don't die to yourself. We are the Lord's. Verse 9, watch it. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived. Not appeared there either, is it? Why? That he might be Lord of the dead and the living. I can't resist this quote from MacArthur. He said Christ died not only to free us from sin, but I love this expression. And if you go to Romans chapter 6 and verse number 22, you'll see where he gets it from. But to enslave us to himself. No, sir, buddy, we're free will Baptists. Let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean you have the free will to live like you want to live after you get saved. We're slaves of Christ. He has enslaved us to himself. In chapter 6 and verse number 22, Paul said this, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end to everlasting life. I'm endeared to the King James Version. That's what I got started off with. That's what I'll finish with. But I want to tell you, I've heard Bible scholars say this, that the King James doesn't do justice here to the Greek doulos when it comes to translating this word for slave. I say to us, we chafe when we hear the word slave. We don't want any part of that. I'll be a servant of the Lord can I tell you, servants have rights, but slave has no rights. And Paul is saying he has enslaved us to himself. MacArthur went on to say, to establish himself as sovereign over the saints in his presence and those still on earth. I wrote this down. He is shown to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. When he died, he gave himself for us. But when he arose, he gave himself to us and now lives in us as our Lord. So what does that mean? What does it mean to confess Christ as Lord? I tell you, it means your entire submission and my entire submission. We sing a lot of songs hypocritically, don't we, preacher? One of them is, I surrender all. Listen, there can be no other king in your life. The Bible says in the Gospels, no man can serve two masters. He desires, he requires, he, he is worthy of your entire submission, your entire surrender of your life. He must be Lord. Many people have said many times, he must be Lord of all if he is to be Lord at all. It means my entire submission, yours. It means my abs uh, his absolute ownership of all that I possess. 
Sometimes we get a little pr- proud, don't we? Come on now, confess. We get a little proud. I'll tell you a quick little story. I had no idea this was, I hadn't thought about this in a long time, not even in my notes. I don't know if I like it or don't like it when that happens, but anyway, here it is. Well, I remember my wife and I first got married. I was so frustrated. We was at Bible college, and we was trying to make a go at it. And I could not figure out how to get credit. I needed a set of tires for my car. You know how I got them tires? Bought a washing machine. That don't make any sense, does it? I had to open up a credit account. Before I could establish any credit. And I remember asking the guy, how in the world are you going to get any credit? You don't have no credit. How do you get credit? So he opened us Goodyear. Goodyear store, we opened that account. And make a long story short, we purchased that washing machine. And we got finally got those tires because we established some credit. We had to get some of that credit. I was riding around on onion peels before I, before I could get, get my tires. <laughs> I'm going to kill myself just trying to establish a little bit of credit. <clears throat> Left Bible college and started pastoring our first church. My wife's from Mahoskey, North Carolina. We just need an automobile. Still didn't have good enough credit to buy an automobile. <laughs> and so I remember my father-in-law said to me, said, y'all, y'all come and we'll go to the bank. We went to the dealership. He knew a guy in Murfreesboro and I'm telling you all that to tell you this. I remember paying that car off on his signature. I remember borrowing money from his signature to get another car. Boy, I was proud as a peacock preacher when I went to the Southern Bank the next time on my own, I had finally gotten enough credit that I could borrow some money on my signature. Boy, I left the bank that day thinking I owned the world because I could get me some money on my signature. Now, I told you that to simply tell you this. Somehow, sometimes, some ways, we really have that mentality of what we own. I've pastored people that's owned multiple houses, multiple cars, multiple boats, multiple businesses. I want to tell you something. We don't, we don't own anything. He is absolute owner of all that we possess. And when we give what the Lord has laid on our heart, I'm submitting to you this evening that that's only a tangible expression of the fact that he owns it all anyway. It means my entire submission. It means his absolute ownership. And it means my unquestioned obedience. Jesus asked a pertinent question in Luke 6, 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Y'all got this thing called parenting figured out yet? I got it figured out. You know when I figured it out? When my kids were grown and gone. I know how to do it now that my job's over. We raised three children. Thank the Lord for our family. And I won't tell you, being a parent's a hard job. But I've never known of a time in my time of parenting or pastoring people who, who parent and wash them. I've never known of a single solitary time but what a child would come to their parents lovingly obediently, willingly submit to their authority, realizing mom and daddy owns it all. I told a fellow this morning, said I raised my kids as best I could on two philosophies. Number one, the philosophies of Scripture and the philosophies of Bill Cosby. Say amen right there. Before he, before he went crazy, what I'm telling you. <laughs> he messed my sermon up, Brother Cody. <laughs> I'd tell them little kids, I bought you in this world, I'll take you out. Say amen right there. That's what he used to say. <laughs> uh, but listen, uh, 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 ha- listen, the, the Bible says, as, a, as the Father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Father, listen, 
You ever, you ever thought that you, you could be withholding your own blessings because of your actions? He lavishes out his love and his mercy and his grace. He pities, he, he pities those who fear him. I'm telling you this evening, this title of lordship is important. This takeover as lordship is very important. Now what about the testimony of lordship? Peter said, I want you to know who you crucified. You crucified our Lord and Christ. You've heard this preached multiple times. I know you have. I've known this ministry for a long time. I've known the pastors who's preach here. I know you know what I'm fixing to tell you. It's not going to be some new discovery, but listen, hear me out. The Bible says that one day every knee shall bow. I can see you shaking your hand, you, uh, head, heads. You know where I'm going. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall what? Confess. Oh, there's coming that day. But what I want to submit to you tonight on the authority of the Word of God, don't wait till that day to confess Him as Lord. Do it now. Confess Him as Lord in your life now. You see, that's the wonderful thing. We don't have to wait until we die to cast our crowns at His feet and to live in obedience and total surrender to Him. He wants me to do that now. I'll give you some things about this testimony. This confession, if you will. This testifying that the Lord Jesus, it'll conquer Satan. Say, preacher, what are you talking about? I want to go back to the verse I mentioned a moment ago. We use it in the Romans road to salvation. Romans 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy what? Mouth. I watched every one of you come in here this evening and tried my best to look at you, make sure I had good preaching material tonight. Say amen right there. I noticed everybody's got a mouth. <laughs> Some of us have been using that mouth more than just talking. Say amen right there. <laughs> that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. In other words, I believe you could translate it this way. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord. By the way, this world's had enough of us saying what we do. We need to show them. We need to have a testimony of openly declaring that Jesus is Lord of my life. Revelation 12, verse 11, listen here. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You see, I believe with all of my heart this evening that, con that confession, this testifying, this testimony, and conquest are linked together. How does Satan flee? The Bible says, of course, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Where do you think that resisting comes from? One of the reasons I like studying is finding these nuggets like I found this week. Watched a lot of football growing up. Played a lot of football growing up. Never had heard his name. Had I heard his name, I'd have lived long enough, Brother Cody, I forgot it. Let me see. Let me do a little test on you, see if you'd ever heard of John... Bramlett. No, I don't see any hands. Well, I didn't either until I got to studying on him. NFL linebacker in the late 60s, early 70s. From Memphis, Tennessee. He was an All-State, All-American in high school. Played college football for Memphis State. Signed a contract to play baseball with the St. Louis Cardinals but he didn't play baseball. Signed the contract, but never played. Why? Because he's living such a wild life, they kicked him off the team. As a matter of fact, he signed a contract with the Denver Broncos. By the way, can I tell you where I got this information from, and I'll tell you why I'm excited about it after I tell you where I got it from. Wikipedia. <laughs> that trusted theological site. <laughs> But, 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 but I'm going somewhere, and I'll come back to that in a second. He signed the contract with the Denver Broncos and was named runner-up NFL rookie of the same year behind this name you'll know, Joe Namath, 1965. 
John Bramlett paid, uh, played for the New England Patriots, was named MVP for the team in 1970, but also got into more trouble, more trouble so much that they nicknamed him the meanest man in football. But I was reading, and then I came to this line, and here's why I told you it was on Wikipedia, because I couldn't believe they put this in there. And here's what it said. In 1973, he became a Christian and abandoned his wild lifestyle. <laughs> I said, you go, Wikipedia, you got something right. That's what you're supposed to do when you get saved. Say amen right there. But the preacher that I was reading after this story had met him and was talking to him when a group of his old buddies come up with beer in hand and said, come on, John, let's go party. And the preacher said, I watched John to see what he would do. And he said, guys, didn't I tell you what the Lord has done for me? He's changed my life. And that's the point the preacher was making. Satan fled. Satan left him alone. When John confessed with his mouth when he declared, Jesus is my Lord, testifying the, that, that Jesus is Lord will conquer Satan. Number two, testifying that Jesus is Lord will confirm the saints. I love testimony services in our churches. I love those popcorn testimonies. I remember as a child being at summer camp and we always had a bonfire where you'd pick up a limb and you'd throw that limb on the bonfire and you'd give the testimony. And I love those precious words when saints would stand and say, I want to thank the Lord for my salvation. They'll give a testimony about when they got saved. But then sometimes... They'll give a testimony of what they've been through recently. I went through an evangelism training program years ago called Faith. This helped me with this tremendously because a lot of Christians, the only testimony they want to tell is when they got saved, but they don't have a current testimony. I submit to you maybe the reason they don't is because nothing's happening in their Christian faith. And they'll talk about storms they've weathered I remember when I was diagnosed with cancer. In 2014, I had stage 2 colorectal cancer. And the phone calls began to flood in. And people began to pour into my life and tell me how they got through their experience. I've, I've had people who've raised children before us. We'd be going through a tough time and I'd have some old saint of God come up who'd already fought some battles with their teenagers and that got us through. And I'm telling you, that's what I'm talking about. When we testify, we're confirming among the saints that Jesus is Lord. Well, listen, number three, testifying that Jesus is Lord will convict sinners. Sort of what I was talking about a moment ago, but I want to take a different twist to it. You know, we're hearing a lot of people say, well, I'm shy. By nature, I, I'm an introvert. I know you might not believe that listening to me, but I really am by nature. I'm all right by myself. I'm shy. I'm reserved. I find it sometimes still a struggle to get one-on-one -on -one with a with a person and share my faith. And you know, I hear this little thing, in my, this little voice in me rather sometimes, well, just be sure you're living right in front of them. Now, that is important. I don't negate that at all. But my friend, folks don't get saved but by my testimony. Folks don't get saved by your testimony. Now, I'm sure your testimony is good, and I want you to keep sharing it. But let me tell you what you need to be sure you include in your testimony, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They may not understand. I love the Gideons. Any Gideons here tonight? I love the Gideon stories. I got to come down here and tell you this. This is my all-time favorite Gideon story. I was at a Gideon banquet not long ago, and I got up next to a Gideon. I said, I'm going to tell you my favorite Gideon story. I want you to verify whether it's true or not. I said, where y'all get them stories anyway? But all this testifies to the power of God. 
Gideon was out on the street one day passing out those little New Testaments. Whoever he handed it to threw it in the trash can. And here come an old drunk. And all he was looking for was a, now some of you are not going to have a clue what I'm talking about, and you're going to need to ask your grandma and granddaddy what I'm talking about after I'm done. Or your preacher will tell you what I'm talking about. <laughs> he was looking for a thin piece of paper to roll up his tobacco. You understand what I'm saying? He was just looking for a thin piece of paper to roll up his tobacco to smoke his cigarette. And the Gideon said the guy smoked his way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before he got saved. Say amen right there. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> said he smoked his way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John until he got saved. But how did he get saved? He didn't have a preacher around. He didn't have a Sunday school teacher around. Didn't have a Christian around. He had the scriptures. In his eyes, the Gideon told me, said his eyes fell on the scriptures one day before he rolled up the paper and the Holy Spirit arrested him and he was gloriously saved. Oh, thank God for the testimony of the saints. Thank God for testifying that Jesus is Lord and will convict sinners. Number four, and finally testifying that Jesus is Lord and will control our service. What are you talking about, preacher? Listen, when we say that Jesus is Lord, a lot of our decision-making is drastically narrowed. There's a lot of decisions we make as believers. Young people making a lot of decisions in following Christ. But I'll tell you, it's not just when you're young. It's when you're older as well. That, that surrendering to the Lordship of Christ, confessing Him as Lord of your life, simply narrows a lot of decisions. I'll just share one, not because I've got a big S on my chest that said I'm a super saint and I'm more spiritual than anybody. I still struggle. I want you to know that. But I started traveling in 2016. I stay in multiple hotels a lot of time away from my wife. I heard this from somebody else. And so I practiced it in my life. I said, when I go into those hotels, I'm not going to be tempted by that television. I'm just not going to turn it on. You see, if you don't turn the thing on, you don't have to fight the temptation. Say amen right there. You see the example that narrowed my decision making? Because your eyes may see something while you're trying to find Fox News, fair, balanced, and conservative is what they used to say. I got a great word for that. That's a bunch of baloney now. Anyway, <laughs> we get off on that. But seriously, it narrows down a lot of decisions. And oh, would to God that I could roll back some time in my life. And I was saved. But I wasn't making good decisions in my life. I was saved. But I was not testifying that Jesus... Listen, the best advice that anybody ever gave to anybody was the advice Mary gave to the service at the wedding of Cana. What did, what did she say? Whatever he tells you to do, do. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to figure that out. Say amen. Whatever. Can you fill in that blank? Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And so this first sermon, could we say at the first Free Will Baptist Church of Jerusalem, could we say that this first sermon of the church on the day of Pentecost was about the Lordship of Christ? Peter said, I want you to know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Listen very carefully. I have prayed and I have asked the Lord, I want to get this right. But I really believe it begs the question, can Jesus be your Savior without being your Lord? Can I tell you as respectfully as I know how 
that I have encountered people in my ministry that I really believe all they wanted was glorified fire insurance. We sit around what we used to call CTS many, many years ago. We sit around a Sunday evening CTS class and we were discussing our convergent experience. Brother Cody, I kid you not, there was about seven people in that room that night, in that little, little room, Darlington, South Carolina. And without exception, everybody, me included, without exception, everybody in that room said the reason they got saved was because they didn't want to die and go to hell. Except one lady. And I believe that began to be a turning point in my, in my life. She said, I got saved because I was so overwhelmed with the love of God. And that lady, her and her husband faithfully served the Lord until she died just recently a few years ago. Her daughter died. Her son-in-law died. I've seen that family go through so much suffering. But I say to us this evening that one of the most important decisions anybody will ever make is the decision of salvation. I, I heard a sermon many, many years ago when I started in the ministry. A lot of people get bogged down between Calvary and Pentecost, and I believe that's what I'm trying to say. They've been to Calvary but they've never had a Pentecostal experience, if I could use that word, uh, that phrase, where the Holy Spirit comes into our life and we confess, Jesus is my Lord. So I, I went back to one of the greatest conversions recorded in Scripture. I heard Brother Fred Warner preacher from Arkansas say many, many years ago, perhaps Paul was the greatest Christian who's ever lived the Christian life, and the Christian era is not even over yet. How did Paul get saved? He was on that Damascus road. Bear with me just a little, a little bit longer. He was on that Damascus road with letters in hand to persecute Christians. That light shined down, blinded him, you remember what he said? Lord. Lord. What wilt thou have me to do? And here's my closing thought. Have we confessed him as Lord? Maybe, maybe you as a Christian need to have a coronation service tonight. So what's a coronation service? Well, we saw one just a few months back when the queen died. Her son, heir to the throne, was crowned king. That was a coronation celebration. That was a crowning of a king. And I wrote this down. Wouldn't you like to have a coronation service today? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth a royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth a royal diadem and crown him Lord of all.